We're in Romans chapter number six, and um, the last couple of messages, we've been looking at what it means to be in Christ and um, to live from our union with Christ. It's just, I guess I want to say it's like my passion for the church to understand that, that the gospel is so much more than just having your sins forgiven and going to heaven when you die. That doesn't mean, when I say that, I don't mean that that's not important. I'm just saying that's like, that's just a small part of what God has for you. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And if you're here this morning, and you don't know that your sins are forgiven and heaven is your home. Well, then I, I want to encourage you to receive Christ this morning and, and to put your faith in him. But I would hope you understand and, and as we go through Romans is that God did so much more than just forgive us and promise us a home in heaven. He came to give us his life and to be life for us, to free us from the bondage of sin. And, and uh, two weeks ago, we were looking at uh, what it means to be baptized into Christ, to be immersed or to find in him to be our complete identity. I mean, baptism is a beautiful picture of what Paul describes uh, in the first few verses. So let's start looking at verse number five. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Well, Father, we thank you so much um, for who you are for us and your incredible love for us. Uh, we were singing that song, You're a Good, Good Father. And Lord, um, we know you're always good and we can give thanks for all things, even though we sure don't understand the struggles that we go through. But we know that you use them for good. You use them to manifest your life in us and through us. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, we would receive from you your word that your spirit would speak into our hearts and keep uh, working to bring about our transformation and i pray lord that if there's anyone here who doesn't really know you that today would be the day of a, a, a new relationship and a heart filled with joy we ask this in jesus name amen so um paul starts off here in verse number five and he says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his. And he uses this word for if. And it maybe seems complicated because it might seem like, well, there's a condition. And really, the only condition really is have you received Christ. And so since you're here this morning and we're going to operate on the assumption that you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, when you see for if, instead of saying for if, then say to yourself since, because it's the same meaning in the Greek. So since we, that's you and I, Paul speaking to the church at Rome, since we have been united with him in a death like his. Um, it, 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 the word united means to graft a branch into another. Do you remember in John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. And what was he talking about was he was saying that he is the true source of life. All of us we saw earlier, we were born into Adam and we're born again into Christ. It's kind of like God takes a very sharp knife. He, he cuts us out of who we were in Adam and he seals us in the person of Jesus Christ. He grafts us in so that we have a new source of life. And he says that we've been united with him in a death like his. And what is so important is that you and I understand that we aren't here to do life on our own. The gospel isn't, hey, Jesus forgives you of your sins and gets heaven your home, and now you do the best you can until you get to heaven. That really wouldn't be that good of news, would it? 
And, and the gospel is not a self-improvement program. And the gospel is not a self-help program. The gospel is a, pro, uh, a program, but is, is the message, the declaration that you died because you needed to die. The old you in Adam, it needed to die. It's not dying daily. It's you coming to the end where you receive Christ. He cuts you from who you were in Adam. He grafts you into the person of Jesus Christ. Christ. The grafting process brought the branch of one vine into another so that there would be a whole new way of living, a whole new source of life so that we begin to realize that Christ lives in me. We live in him and he lives in us. The, the Bible reminds us many times he asks the question, don't you know well, of course, what is he saying? He's saying, you ought to know. But we forget, don't we? He wants us to live moment by moment, day by day, you know, at our workplace, in our home, where we go for fun. He wants us to live moment by moment as those who are in union with the Creator. He is not distant to us. We are not alien to Him. He says, listen, he lives in you. Don't you know that you're the temple of the living God? What does that mean? He says that you are the dwelling place of the creator. Why is he living in you? He lives in you so that he can live or manifest or reveal his life through you. There's a complete breaking of one relationship and the beginning of an entirely new one. We are united with Christ in his death. And that death was a necessity so that we could be free from our place in Adam. We are no longer in Adam in any sense. The tie is totally broken. Now, when I was a Catholic, growing up Catholic, we would always wear a, a, like a, well, it was cool, we have a little gold chain, and the, you know, the bigger gold chain it was, the better. But then we would have a little crucifix on it, and on, we called it a crucifix because it was a cross with Jesus on it. And it was supposed to be a reminder to each of us every day, every time we felt it or looked at it, it was supposed to be a reminder that Jesus died for us. Now, Protestants, they got to go one step more. They took Jesus off the cross and left it empty because they're emphasizing the resurrection. So the Catholics are emphasizing step number one, and the Protestants are emphasizing step number two, because they're both necessary, right? There's no substitute to death, but, but that's not the end of the story. It, he rose again. But, you know, I had this thought, now I'm, I'm going to start a new jewelry fashion. Now, if you take this and you start a business, you've got to tithe on it, okay? But I thought, well, you know what we really need is not a blank cross, or a cross with Jesus on it, we need a cross with a mirror on it. Because most people I know, they don't live as though they died with Christ. They acknowledge freely that Jesus died, but what is the scripture saying? Who died with him? Yeah, that was pretty good, 25%. <laughs> Who died? Jesus. We did. And you see, he wants you to live moment by moment, day by day, seeing yourself in the cross with Jesus, that you were in union with him. And then it says, and we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So he's saying, listen, the death is absolutely necessary to break the tie that we had to Adam as sinners he said, but that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. Not only did you die with him, you were buried with him. But that's not good enough because if you're buried, you're still in the grave. And what do dead people need more than anything else? They need life. And so what did he do? He rose again on the third day, but who rose with him? Oh, come on. We got to have better participation than that. Because like, I'm hungry and I want to have lunch. And if you don't participate, this message could go on forever. So, so who died? We die. And who rose again? 
we did. He's saying you and I are united with him. Moment by moment. So like when you wake up in the morning, united with him. And when you go to work, united with him. And when you go to play, you're united with him. And you come home at night and you're united with him. That there's nothing you do, no experience you face, no advers- adversity that you face. Where you face it in your own power. Because many times when, you know, when life's rocking and rolling and everything's going good and, and the business is making money, oh, we feel good. And hey, thank you, Jesus. But what happens when you get sick? Or there's no money in the bank or you lose your job or you, you, know, you brought to nothing. He's saying, listen, I'm with you. You are united to me and I favor you. Have you ever wondered, like, I wonder what God's opinion of me is? Hmm. Now, as a, I've been doing ministry for 30-something years now, I don't ask what anybody's opinion is anymore. No way. People are just too honest. <laughs> I just focus on God's opinion of me. Because this is right. why it's important to know that you're united with him. Because if you live as a separate entity to Christ, you, you might be thinking, you know, God, uh, he don't really like me. He knows about my divorce. He knows about my adulteries. He knows about the affairs. He knows about my addiction. He knows about my lying. He knows about my greed. He knows about my covetousness. He knows about, and he, he knows, a, and he must have a very negative opinion of me. But do you see the beauty of being united to Christ? So let me ask you, instead of what is God's opinion of you, what is God's opinion of his son? Amen. That's good in preaching. And what's his opinion of you? You see, friends? See, this is the poison of religion that puts us on a performance treadmill. The, 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 the poison of, of, of religion is that we, we somehow by our own self-effort and by our own improving and getting better and stronger and doing more, that somehow God's opinion of us is growing and growing and growing. But he's saying, listen, no, my opinion of you is based on my opinion of my son, and you are one with my son. And we need to live from this place where we are united to him. We're united in the likeness of his death. And that requires also that we are reunited with him in the resurrection. We aren't a people of the grave. And church should never be a place of death. But for so many of us, we, we were in churches that all they did was produce death. And how did they produce death? Well, they focus on our performance. They put us on a treadmill of performing. They put us on a treadmill of getting better. They put us on a treadmill of doing more. And the more the emphasis is on you, the more trouble you're in. When they put you under the law, what does the law do? It reveals what a mess you and I are. When the focus is you and I, even even though we have our successes, they're always a failure. We live in death. We live in guilt. We live in shame because we've never done enough and we never measured up. And what he wants us to come to the realization is to realize that we have been united to him. We are a people of the resurrection. We are people who live in resurrection life. Do you remember, I guess a few weeks ago, I was preaching, I think, and I told you the story about Lazarus, and I think from John 11, and do you remember that story? So I don't need to repeat it. See, I'm trying to keep you cooperating with me. Yeah, yeah, we, so, we remember, Pastor, yeah. So in that story, right, Jesus comes, and, and, and he's a little bit late by uh, Mary and Martha's schedule. And he comes and they, he says, like, where is, where is he laid? And, and then there's the tomb. And they said, don't, he says, roll away the stone. They go, ah, you might want to think about that. He's been dead for four days. He's going to stink. But they rolled away the tomb. Jesus had them do what they could do. He had them roll away the tomb. And then he calls forth and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And there comes Lazarus, barely able to walk because he's been wrapped 
and burial cloth. And as I was meditating on that, I thought, you know, Tim, this is your job every Sunday, just removing burial cloth. Because I'm not talking to a people who are dead. I'm talking to people who have been risen together with Christ. But the problem is, there's still a lot of burial cloth on you. There's still a lot of the remnants of death, the remnants of thinking that somehow through, through my own determination and my own willpower, I can get better and I can do more and I can improve upon what Christ has already done. Then look what he says. He says, and we know, this is verse number six. I want you to start here, but he said, we know that our old self was crucified with him, knowing this, or we know that, depends on the translation. Paul is saying to the believers that it's something you should know. I mean, when you see this phrase, you need to lock in and start meditating on it and letting it become a part of your vocabulary, a, a, a daily, a moment-by-moment -moment remembrance. Paul is saying to the believers, you should know this. This is an important truth that Jesus was crucified and we were crucified too. When we receive Christ, the old us, the sinner us, those the, 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 uh, us born in Adam was crucified and put to death. And it's interesting in the Greek that the old here doesn't refer to chronological age, but to something that is completely worn out and useless. Everything that we were in Adam, worn out, useless. All that we could ever be in Adam was sinners. And that was the purpose of the law. Now, before we go through the rest of the verse, I want you to look at Galatians 2.20. How many of you have this memorized? One of the first verses I, I memorized. But I want us to walk through it. Because I, in, in, in my Bible, I always, when I get a, Bible, a new Bible and I get to this verse, I always circle I. Because he wants you to internalize the same truths that he's teaching in Romans numbers, chapter 6. So he says, I have been crucified with Christ. So who's been crucified with Christ? I have. And it is no longer who? I who live. Oh, really? No, I, I, do you see what he's saying? He's saying, listen, I cut you out of Adam. I grafted you into the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is now the source of your life. Christ is your life. So he's saying it is no longer I, no longer you and I as individuals who are living. We, we were dead. And all we could produce was more death. But he says, listen, what I did was, he says, I put my life in you so I no longer am the one who lived, but who? But Christ lives in me. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you, you think about you. I mean, you take a good, long thought about you. And you think, man, me? Me? But this is the truth of the scripture. He says, listen, I live in you. I am your source. And then he says, and the life I now live in the flesh. This is a kind of a challenging word in the scripture because it comes from the Greek word sarx. And sometimes Paul uses it to refer to a physical body. And sometimes he uses this word to refer to self-sufficiency, what we do in our own power. But here he's speaking about the physical body. He says, in the life I now live in the physical body, I live by faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is my receptivity to whose activity? To God's activity. But I now live by faith in me. In my getting better, in my improving, in my doing more, in my stopping these behaviors and changing these attitudes, I live by faith in who? The Son of God. You see, what the gospel rings us to is not how, how we get on a self-improvement project until we're, we're, we're suited for heaven. He's saying, listen, the gospel is all about 
about God. And it's not our faith in us. It's our faith in the Son of God who says, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see yourself today as one in whom God loves? Now, I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of times, I think, it, you know, I've seen it mostly in the last couple of years as I've been struggling with, you know, uh, health problems was, you know, I'm like sitting there going, you know, Lord, why? Why this? Why now? You know, and battling my questions and worrying about the future and all kinds of crazy things that go on. But you know what I keep coming back to? He loves me. Why? Why is this happening? I don't know. You don't. And and don't try to explain to me. <laughs> right. Please. Buy me lunch, but don't try and explain to me why this is happening to me. Why, why do we do that to people as though we knew? You don't know any more than I do. And I don't know why you go through things. All I know is this. He loves me, and the evidence of his love for me is that he gave himself for me. Now look at verse number 6 again uh, of Romans 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The first phrase there, he, uh, the second phrase there is that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Brought to nothing is katargeo, meaning to render inoperative or invalid. Our body of sin has been rendered powerless. The idea is of put out of business. We need to see that sin is powerless to control us. It only has the power that we give it. Your sinful nature, the sum total of your sin, is rendered powerless. Have, has anybody in here ever... Uh, you know, you've been to a, where, where you worked or you've been to a place where you have to have a, you know, employee ID card. You know, you have a lanyard and you, and you pull it out and you slide it through the machine. And then you punch in a four digit code. No. Yeah. You know what I mean? And what is that? That that card and that code says you have access. Listen, when we were in the first Adam. The enemy had unhindered access to us. Why did we sin? Because we were sinners. Why, why did we fall for his temptations? Because we were sinners. He had unhindered access to us. But do you see what the scripture is trying to say? Satan's coming to you. He's sliding his card. He's punching the code and the code don't work no more. Nathan and I were in Manila, and, you know, I've got the memory, well, I don't even know what kind of memory I have. I can never even remember where I am, right? I go into a parking lot, Clark, going, beep, 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 there I am. Yeah, now I remember, right? But so we're walking down the hallway in the hotel, going back to the hotel room one night, and I got the card out of my pocket, and I swipe, and I yank the door, and it won't open, I slide it again and yank the door. It won't open. Wrong door. <laughs> Wrong door. Um, <clears throat> my car did not give me access to that door. Thank God. No one was in the room, came out, wondered what in the world I was doing. But what I wanted you to see, listen, you know, look at your life and there's a door. Here's what the enemy's doing. He's used to having unhindered access to your mind. He's used to having unhindered access to your heart. But when you believed in Jesus Christ and when you understand that you've been reunited to the Lord Jesus Christ, the code has been changed. It's become inoperative. He has no access to you. Nothing that he only has the access that you've given to him. So quit opening the door. You see what I'm saying? Because that's what we do sometimes. He comes to the door, beep, beep, and we hear him go, bum, 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 bum. Well, I wonder who's there. You know who's there, and it ain't good. 
Leave the door closed. Say, I'm sorry, Satan. You have no access here. Your control has been made inoperative. You are out of business. This is what the gospel is telling you. It's all become invalid. Your sinful nature, the sum total of your sin, is rendered powerless so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Do you see this picture? He's saying, listen, you used to be slaves to sin, and you sinned. We were born slaves to sin, and we did our master's bidding, but now we are in, are in Christ. Our slavery has been broken, and he says we have a new master. And certainly Romans uses the typology that we are now slaves of righteousness, but I want you to see that you are so much more than a slave that you are a child of the king. And the child, the children of the king, the sons of the king, they have responsibilities to function in the kingdom, but none of those responsibilities, none of those things that they do make them a, king, a king's son. And this is the difference between what we're talking about, a relationship with Christ, and being sons. And he wants you to realize, listen, all the access that Satan had and all the chaos that he brought, the hell on earth he created for your life, all of that has become inoperative. Don't open the door. Why? Because you are no longer a slave to sin. You are a child of God. We do not have to sin. No one can make us sin. If we do, it's because we allow it to happen. But we are now the children of God. Now, one little truth I want to add here. The old self is dead, but the flesh is alive and well. Now, the flesh, when I use this word flesh, I'm using it like Paul uses it in the latter part of Romans there. When he, and what he means is not your physical body. He means your self-sufficiency. The flesh is all that we do in self-sufficiency. All that we do in our own power. All that we do in our strength. And this is what gets us in trouble. The new birth in Christ brings death to the sinful self, but it does not bring death to this desire to live in our own strength, to do things in our own power. The Bible talks about the flesh is distinct from the old self. The old self was our identity in Adam, our sinful nature, and he says that was crucified. But the flesh, all that we do in self-sufficiency, the self-life, he was trained, it was trained by the old self, and we need to kind of, that's why we constantly are renewing our minds, refusing to be conformed into the world's mold so that we might experience transformation. Now let's go down to verse 7 through 10. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. For one who has died, let me ask you a question this morning before we go on. Have you died? Yeah, okay, yeah. But have you been united to Christ by faith? Okay, that's the important part. For one who has died has been what? Set free from sin. You see, the enemy is still coming with his card and his code. And he's going to keep coming after you the rest of your life. But you need to live as one who's been united to him. We were born slaves and we had no choice to sin. But all that has changed because you and I have been freed from sin. And we must remember who God has made us to be. I mean, we were singing it about it this morning. I am who God says I am. All that sin is brings us into bondage, brings death, shame, guilt, 
But he says, now you are a free people because you left the guilt and the death and the shame in the tomb and you rose again. Sin remains an alien power trying to dominate and control our bodies and souls, but we must refuse to give it access, refuse to open the door. We remember who God has made us to be. Then he says, now if, and remember, what is now if? Since. Since. We have died with Christ. We believe that we will also live with him. This is the beautiful thing. You know, Paul said to be absent from the body is to be what? To be present with the Lord. What do we do? We have this great confidence that the Christ who lives in us today is going to unite us in a physical sense, even with our Savior. He lives now and he and he, he, he says here that, he, that, that we will also live with him. So in a sense, when we decide not to sin, we have the power to carry it out because Christ is living in us. If we died with Christ, we believe we also shall live with him. We have to believe what God says is true. Having died to sin, there is only one life for us to live, and that's his life. Going back to Galatians 2.20, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are united to him and will be forever in his presence. Robs, right, the, the power of the enemy really is in deception. Well, what does he use? He uses fear to try and captivate our minds and thinking. And then we start forgetting, hey, listen, I'm not doing this on my own. I'm not doing this in my own power. I'm not facing the future from my own strength. I don't have to figure the whole thing out. Who lives in me? Who's the source of my life? Christ is my life. And I'm united to him. And so we are now able to live with him in righteousness because that's who he made us to be. Because we've been grafted into a new life source. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Christ, having been raised from the dead, he says, dies no more. We've got to settle this point in our thinking and our believing. Jesus died one time, and through that sacrifice, satisfied forever all of the demands of sin, and it's settled There is no sin issue to be settled. The cross satisfied all those demands. Lazarus, we talked about a little bit, he was raised to life only to die again. But Jesus rose never to die again. And it says, and death no longer has dominion over him. What is the idea of dominion? Well, Yeah, to the power or to reign. The sin that produces death in our lives is no longer master over us, just as it is not his master. Death reigned over us before Christ, but now its domain and reign have been overthrown, and only Jesus reigns in us. I know, like, I was just thinking about it. It was like, people get worried. Like, they say, Pastor... If you keep preaching on grace like this and freedom like this, aren't you worried that people are just going to go out and sin? Well, let me tell you what my observation is. You're already doing that quite well. No, I am not worried that if I teach you Christ is life and the one who reigns in your life is going to lead you to more sin. Because people say, are you free to sin? I go, that's an oxymoron. Free to what? Free to bondage? Because isn't that what it is? 
It, it, free, is that like free to sin? Like, man, will, will you struggle at times with temptation and will you fail? Sure you will. But he's saying, listen, freedom, sin isn't freedom. Sin is bondage. And what he's trying to get you to realize is that old bondage has no right over your life, no reason to rule in your life. The power has been broken. Hebrews 10.10, 10, and by that will, I want you to read these next four words very carefully, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now listen. I, I, got, I, I came to Jesus. I got born again. I was a saved. And you know what happened to me? I, maybe it happened to you in some experience. But what happened to me was all of a sudden, the, the pastors, the church, they went about trying to get me sanctified. They wanted to clean up my life. They wanted to straighten me out. And God bless them, there was, there was a lot of work for them to do. And what did they do? They started with a new list. They started working on me. They, okay, no, don't drink and don't smoke and don't dance and don't chew. And, 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 I, you know, and, and there was a long list. I can't remember the whole list. But there was a long list of don'ts. And then there was a long list of do's. And they were saying, like, listen, if you could just be successful in not doing these 10 things and doing these 10 things, then you'd be well on your way to being sanctified. What a lie. You know what the Bible says? Look at that again. And by that will, what? We have, what does that mean? It's a past act and it's perfect. We have been sanctified. That means we have been made holy. We are called saints because we are those who have been sanctified. And how were we sanctified? Well, we started tithing and we quit drinking. Some of you are in big trouble. Uh, how did we get sanctified? Well, we quit going to the movies. Uh, how, how did we get sanctified? And, and we, no. No, no. We got sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ every Sunday. So every Sunday we're going to have a mass and re-crucify Jesus so that we can get everybody cleaned up from the previous week. No, listen. That, that's how we did it in Catholicism, but I hung out with Pentecostal and Baptist too, and, and they have their own way of doing it. Right? We used to have, we used to have the altar call. You guys know what an altar call is? Yeah, we had an altar call. And I, man, every Sunday morning we had an altar call. And I had my rear end down there because, man, there was something I had messed up during the week. But then we had church on Sunday night. And most Sunday nights I was back down there because there's eight hours between Sunday morning and Sunday night. And then we had it Wednesday. And I was always down there. And I was coming down to that altar. And I was getting on my knees. And I'd say, Jesus, I will never do this again. And there I was back on Sunday night. You know what I was trying to do? I was trying to sanctify myself. I was trying to clean up my act. I was trying to get it together. I was trying to be one of the holy people. And you know what I realized was that all that they were doing and all that I was becoming was becoming a Pharisee. Where I was developing a righteousness based on my own self-effort and my heart was becoming ever increasingly judgmental against everyone who couldn't do as good as me. And what I also noticed is that a lot of people, they quit going forward and they quit going to church because they knew they couldn't keep up. But what if we just live the truth of Hebrews 10.10 10, and Romans chapter number 6, and realize that we are sanctified by His one offering once for all. 
Now, friends, you've got to understand the other side of this coin is that are all my attitudes and all of my actions sanctified? Well, of course not. And that's why in, the, in Scripture, sometimes you'll see that, that what is he doing? He's actively, progressively sanctifying our behaviors and attitudes to conform to our identity. Do you see it? It's, it's two sides of one coin. But the religious people are always trying to modify the behaviors and the attitudes in order to gain an identity. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is that your actions and attitudes need to flow from your identity. It's the reverse process. One brings freedom and one brings bondage. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. His death wasn't a tragic mistake, but a purposeful death. He died to remove sin as the obstacle, the obstacle to our being in relationship to our Creator. He died to sin once for all. He lived a perfect, sinless life, but He died to it just the same because He was taking our place. He died to sin, taking the penalty that you and I deserve. He met all of the demands our sin required. The high priest had to make an offering for his own sin, and then he would go into the holiest of holies and make an offering for the people, and that lasted for as long as they had committed no sin and then they had to wait a whole nother year no friends there was no end of sacrifice in the old covenant no end of sacrifice but jesus died once and there is no need for any additional sacrifice he achieved a victory that will never need repeating and that's why he says that you are are now more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You need to stop trying to improve on Jesus' work. You need to stop trying to come alongside him and help him and rest in who he made you to be. And then the last phrase, and we'll end with this, but the life he lives, he lives to God. He lived for the will of his Father in every way. I mean, we tend to focus on Jesus dying on the cross, but we must remember that he uh, is no longer on the cross. He is risen. And so, too, are we. And we need to get in our mind a picture of a cross with a mirror so that we see ourselves there. And remind others to see themselves in the mirror, on the cross, united to him. Just as he lives to God, we are called to live to God. And so what, you, what, what I hope that you see is that Jesus died for me. You've heard me say this a hundred times, right? Today, but you'll hear it a hundred times more next week. Jesus died for me. So that Jesus could live in me. And living in me, he desires to live his life through me. And so he says, he lived, Jesus lives to God. So we live from God and to God. He lived for the will of his Father in every way. Just as he lives to God, you and I are called to live to God. So, wrap it up. The old you was crucified. How many people lived through a crucifixion? You know? In the history of crucifixions, have you ever read a story of someone who survived? No. Nope. I read some story about some guys who survived a hanging. Ooh, could you imagine how gruesome that would be? Like you get hanged and they didn't do the rope right and the neck didn't break and so they survived and, well, they live. And I guess if you had the, what was the firing squad, you know, I guess uh, they could shoot and miss or uh, not hit any vital organs or something, you could survive. But you know what? He didn't say you went to a firing squad, you didn't go to a hanging. You went to a crucifixion and you did not survive. 
Do you hear me? It is no longer we who live. Why? We were crucified with who? Him. And who lives in us now? He. So it's not me who's living. I know, like, wow, it sure feels weird. <laughs> I got it, but let it, let it sink in your heart. You don't have to die to you. You have to reckon yourself dead to you. He crucified you. And everything you were in Adam as a sinner, as an adulterer, as a thief, as a liar, as a drunk, as an addict, as a whatever, died. All those former identities died. And you have one identity, beloved of God, child of God, united to him. And your relationship to sin has changed forever. Now, don't get mistaken. The enemy, he's going to come with his access card and punch in a code and yank on the door. Sometimes in Scripture, it's called fiery darts. But you know what? Leave the door closed. I'm talking about your mind. I'm talking about your mind. Because what do we do? We open our mind and say, okay, welcome. And we entertain these horrible thoughts and deceptions and lies and deceit and desires that are contrary to who you say. No, man, close the door on the enemy. And remind yourself what's true of you. Because the new you lives. Everything about the old you was put off, and the new you that draws life from God's indwelling life has been put on. You are who he says you are. Sin, still trying to exert power, still trying to gain access, <clears throat> but it's lost its access to you. The sin issue has been settled for ever. Jesus died for a sacrifice 2,000 years ago once for all. Temple sacrifice, man, it's done. It's done. And I don't think there's going to be a temple with sacrifices. Why? What's the need for it? Have you thought about it? Because I know some people, well, never mind, I'm not going to go down that road. That's another hour-long sermon. Quit looking for a new temple for new sacrifices. Jesus died once for all. He paid it all. And the perfect sacrifice for all of our failures, all of our guilt, all of our shame, leave all of that in the grave. Because you have risen to newness of life. And living to God is our destiny. We have a whole new life, a whole new source for that life, a whole new way of living, a whole new set of priorities. When we're, we were in Adam, it's normal for us to be self-centered and selfish. When we were in Adam, it was normal for us to be consumers. It was normal for us to be materialists. It was no normal for us to be narcissists, whatever, go down the list. But just as Jesus lived for the will and purposes of his Father, we are to live for the will and the purposes of him who called us his beloved. And that means we need to look at how we are living and who it is for. We need to live for God in the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money, and the way we give sacrificially to his kingdom. No laws, relationships. Father, thank you for these dear people. I love them. And I just pray that the word would settle deep in their heart and you'd make it real to them. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.